Hello everybody, this is Mr. Jackson. Today we're going to be going through Unit 1, Lesson 2, over energy, producers, and consumers. So let's get into it. Now today we're going to have two learning objectives. By the end of this presentation, hopefully we're able to provide a definition of what it means to be a primary producer. And also we will want to be able to describe the various ways in which consumers are able to obtain energy and nutrients for themselves. As always, going to make sure that we identify before going into the conversation all of the necessary vocabulary that you're going to want to have by the end. Um, I'll go ahead and read off the definitions themselves so that we know how they're pronounced, and you can feel free to pause this video if you want to take time to review the definitions. But today we're going to be uh, defining autotroph, primary producer, photosynthesis, chemosynthesis, heterotroph, consumer, and detritus. So first learning objective, what does it mean to be a primary producer? What is that definition? Um, so it's important to understand that no living thing can create energy. We cannot create new energy from scratch. We can only convert existing forms of energy into other forms that can be more usable uh, as needed. But no living thing creates that energy, but we do have organisms that are called autotrophs that can actually capture energy from non-living sources and can then convert that energy into forms that living cells can use. Autotrophs are also going to be storing energy away in ways that would make it available to other organisms. So this is why we also call those autotrophs primary producers, because not only are they converting non-living forms to forms that are available to those living forms, they're also going to be storing them away for whenever they can be accessed uh, by those other organisms. So primary producers are going to be the first producers of energy-rich compounds that can then be later used by other organisms uh, in the environments around them. And all life, obviously, is going to depend on these primary producers. So two ways in which these autotrophs, these primary producers, are able to take um, existing forms of energy and convert it to forms that are going to be more usable uh, by living organisms. The first way that we can do that is in a process we call photosynthesis. So photosynthesis is going to be where we use energy from the sun, uh, so that light energy that we get from the sun, and we're going to use that energy to convert carbon dioxide and water in the surrounding atmosphere um, and we're going to convert that into uh, energy-rich compounds like carbohydrates, and we will also be producing oxygen. Um, I've also provided, under our picture here, we've also provided the actual formula, the equation uh, for the process of photosynthesis. It's there for you. You can see that uh, we have the carbon dioxide and the water that will then be uh, converted into carbohydrate and oxygen. Uh, one, one important thing here is not only are we creating the stored energy rich form of carbohydrates such as like sugars and starches, but this is also the process through which we take atmospheric carbon dioxide, that waste product from me, for example, breathing out um, in cellular respiration. We are also going to be able to convert uh, that carbon dioxide into oxygen that can then be used by other uh, living organisms, again, namely me, whenever I breathe in. So that's another part of this process that is of, of special note. And now sometimes we don't have that light energy from the sun available and those environments that are lacking that light energy still have to have ways in which to convert non-usable or non-living forms of energy to forms that can be accessed by living beings. And so for that process we have what's called chemosynthesis. And chemosynthesis is going to be the process that instead of using light energy, we're going to be using chemical energy, um, for example, like um, 
chemical energy can be just like inorganic compounds that can be broken down um, in areas that light does not exist. But we're going to use that chemical energy to produce carbohydrates. Again, those storage forms, those energy rich forms like sugars and starches. And um, that would then be accessible to living organisms. So again, we're going to take the carbon dioxide, oxygen and hydrogen sulfate, uh, sulfide. We're going to utilize the chemical energy, the chemical compounds that exist in those surrounding environments to break down those inorganic compounds and then convert them into organic compounds that can then be used. Um, and we'll also have sulfur compounds uh, as a byproduct of this. But the key thing to take away from this is that photosynthesis is that process in which we use light energy to make that conversion to forms of energy that we can use as living beings. And in the absence of light, we will use chemical energy via chemosynthesis in order to create that stored form of energy as well. So a couple things before we move on. Um, clarification statement here. Neither of these processes, photosynthesis or chemosynthesis, we're not going to be producing new energy from scratch. Again, we can't create or destroy energy. We can only convert it or change its form. Um, so that's one key thing that we don't want to get uh, confused there. Um, a question that we could ask ourselves, where does the energy for photosynthesis and chemosynthesis come from? That might be a good thing to make sure that we review. Where does that energy come from? Well, for photosynthesis, it's going to be the energy in sunlight, that light energy. And for chemosynthesis, remember, that's coming from the chemical bonds, uh, breaking of those chemical bonds in inorganic molecules from the surrounding environment. We can also say, hey, how do you compare and contrast? What are the similarities and differences between these two processes? Um, importantly, the photosynthesis and chemosynthesis processes, they're similar in that both are going to be able to use some form of energy to create or produce carbohydrates, which are those stored sugars and starches that we want accessible um, as living beings. And then also, if we were going to just differentiate or contrast the two, just remember, photosynthesis uses light energy, chemosynthesis uses chemical energy. So that's the primary producers. Those are the autotrophs. Now, we want to get now into the heterotrophs, the consumers, right, the other side of that. So we've produced usable forms of energy, and now how do uh, living beings access that stored form of energy? So animals fungi, many forms of bacteria, they can't harness energy directly from their environments the way that primary producers do. Uh, so these organisms, we call them heterotrophs or also consumers, they have to acquire their energy from other organisms. So usually by eating them um, or consuming them. So consumers are those organisms that rely on other organisms for energy and for nutrients. And we've got six different types of consumers each with their own unique ways of obtaining energy that you're going to need to know the, the names of. And so let's get into those. So first three out of six that we're going to cover today. Uh, first type of consumer, a carnivore. A carnivore is going to exclusively kill and eat other animals for their own energy. So good examples of this would be like snakes, lions, owls, or this river otter that you see over here to the right. Those are all good examples of uh, carnivores that kill and eat other animals. Then you have herbivores. They're sort of like the, uh, the vegans or the vegetarians of the food chains and the food webs. These are going to obtain energy exclusively from nutrients by eating plant leaves, roots, seeds, or fruits. Okay, so no animal uh, sources for their food. Um, good examples of these are going to be like cows, caterpillars, deer, and the macaw that you might see over here to the right. Uh, and then you have omnivores. Omnivores are that middle ground where they're going to be eating both plant and other animals uh, for their food sources. So we as human beings, um, a lot of times we are... Um, Good examples of omnivores, where we have both plant and animal food sources. Uh, bears, pigs, or like this white-nosed coati that you see over here to the right. All examples of organisms that would eat both plant 
and other living beings for their energy needs. And so the last three that we're going to talk about today, these last three types of consumers are um, detritivores, decomposers, and scavengers. Now detritivores are going to chew up or grind down detritus particles into smaller pieces. Detritus are going to be those decaying forms of plants and animals. So dead carcasses that are decaying um, are a really good example or broken down organic compounds that are in the state of decay. Um, that is what we refer to as detritus. So good examples of these are going to be types of mites, snails, crabs, or earthworms like we see over here to the right. Uh, Decomposers are going to specifically feed uh, by chemically breaking down organic materials in their surrounding environment, um, and they are the ones who actually would create those decaying forms of plant and animal uh, resources like detritus. Um, good examples would be a lot of different forms of bacteria or fungi is a good one that we normally associate as decomposers. And then we have scavengers. These are animals that consume the carcasses of other animals that have been killed by predators or have died of other causes. But those scavengers are going to specifically seek out dead animal materials or decaying animal materials for their energy. Uh, really good examples are going to be like flies, hyenas, or vultures. If you've ever seen uh, like buzzards or vultures uh, on the side of the road next to roadkill, like a deer that might have gotten hit on the highway, that is an example of a scavenger. And so the last point that I would like to make before ending this video is that whenever it comes to these different uh, categories of consumers, these consumers are not exclusive to each of these categories all the time. So for example, uh, whereas a lion is typically going to be a carnivore, in a state of need or a state of near starvation, it is very likely that a lion would not pass up its opportunity to become a scavenger, right? To become, um, you know, a need, a, in need of, you know, consuming an animal carcass for its energy source. Um, some of them do remain opposed to each other, like, for example, carnivores and herbivores. By definition, they cannot exist as the same thing. But if they were to dip into both, then we'd have that omnivore as an example there. So um, that is going to conclude our introduction to energy, uh, to primary producers, and to consumers. And I hope that you have found this helpful.